Hello, everyone, and welcome to another VES Artex Academy webinar. And we thank you for joining us on this lovely Friday. Um, today's webinar is going to be presented by Dr. Erin Cordes of the University of Minnesota. And she's going to be presenting on navigating science and communication aspects of sustainable dairy. So thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. Cordes. Um, before we go ahead and get started, um, just one housekeeping item. Um, we will be accepting questions throughout the presentation. Um, so if Dr. Cordes um, is presenting on something that sparks your interest or you have some more um, questions and inquiries on, um, please, please, please type them into the Q&A panel um, on the bottom of your screen and we will address them at the end of the presentation. Um, and with that, um, the floor is yours, Dr. Cordes. Well, I appreciate present on this topic. It's a topic that is uh, near and dear to my heart and been working on on giving similar talks to this this past year. The the focus of this talk really is is to get over some of those uh, communication hurdles when it comes to talking about sustainable dairy production. This presentation is really for dairy farms, and it says Midwest Dairy Farms, but it's really about dairy farms and those who support the dairy industry. This particular work has been supported by Midwest Dairy over the last year and appreciate, um, appreciate that opportunity to work on this topic. So it's really about navigating science and communication aspects of sustainable dairy production. So we can all be part of sustainability conversations within and external to the dairy industry. We don't all need to be experts in this field of science, in the sustainability science, but as dairy farmers or as those that support dairy farmers, I hope to leave you with some ideas on, on how to talk, how to listen, and how to ask questions in these conversations. It is a very broad topic and frankly lacks a lot of definition and that's what we're going to explore today. We're not going to be able to tackle all the ins and outs and definitions that come along with this sustainability term in our allotted time, but I do hope that we can move our conversational knowledge forward. The examples that I'm going to share today are primarily pulled from the environment sector. There is a handout that goes along with this presentation that will be shared as well. And that provides some more exercises and some other resources that you might find useful in your own journey. Before we move too far forward, I do share with you some guiding assumptions that help me enter into sustainability conversations, not just in the agricultural industry, but also you know, with my colleagues here at the university, with my friends and family, or even some assumptions that I try to bring forward when I'm even reading just a newspaper article. In no particular order, these assumptions are that sustainability goals and actions are personal. We all have different goals, we do all have different actions, and we all have different priorities. And because of these differences, and because there are priorities embedded in our sustainability goals, there are benefits and consequences to every decision that is guided by priorities. I look at sustainability as a practice versus a state, and I'm going to uh, explore that or explain what I mean by that a little bit later in the presentation. And I also go into these conversations assuming that there is ambiguity in this topic, yes, but in that ambiguity is some opportunity. There is risk, but in a glass half full approach, I do try to focus on the opportunity. Assumptions are things that we accept as true without firm evidence for proof. So these are some assumptions that I need to keep coming back to as, a, as an individual. And I share them with you. They may become part of your guiding assumptions as well. Um, but even if, if they do, I encourage you to continually check back with them and see if you still agree. Sustainability is a broad and ambiguous topic. So how do we even start to talk about it? One of the first things People often ask me, well, what is your definition of sustainability? I try not to jump right into an answer, but I do recognize that most goals recognize the need to consider social, environment, and economic decision, dimensions, excuse me. 
one of the most quoted goals of sustainable development is that the development meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. And this comes from a Brundtland Commission report in 1987. There is an agricultural sustainability definition from the 1990 Farm Bill in the US, and it highlights environmental, social, and economic aspects in the pursuit of producing food, food, fiber, and fuel from the biosphere. So between these, these broad definitions, these broad definitions, I believe, encompass what most of us accept to be uh, a basic a basis for sustainability. And they're, they're what we want to achieve, right? But there is at the same time a large push from consumers, from society in general, to simply be more specific. So while we can achieve these things, we do need to aim for some more specifics behind our goals. We want, there's this push for specifics despite evolving definitions, interpretations, approaches, and applications. And so how do we even approach these conversations that are ambiguous? So as a framework or a structure for talking about sustainability, I encourage you to use the analogy to a road trip. A road trip analogy aligns with a common but simplified framework for developing sustainable ag programs that includes defining, planning, and implementing. So picture, if you will, a group of friends with a free summer. They have this general goal to make it across the country. They have a general heading direction, but no reservations waiting for, along, waiting for them along the way or at the destination. They have freedom to explore along the way. They want to have fun. They want some new experiences and they want to be safe. So with the general goal of crossing the country, the group still needs to come to some consensus about the plans. They come together, assess the situation, ask questions like, where are we leaving from? What time, money, and vehicles are available? What type of experiences are they looking for? This baseline conversation, this baseline assessment gives them a basis to track their progress from a starting point. It also strengthens the collective vision of where they're going. So in the sustainability plan, sustainability framework, excuse me, this is that planning stage. As free as they are to explore, they still need to chart a course, at least for the first day or so. They need a, a way to get started. The course depends on the map that they have, the roads that are open, the resources available, and the experiences that they're looking for. If there are multiple vehicles in this convoy, there's opportunity for each car to take a different road. You know, one car may want to explore every single museum along the way. Another may want to stop at the largest ball of twine. You know, another one, another vehicle might just simply want to limit their time on the road. They want to get to the next hotel, the next stopping point as fast as possible so that they can relax. Every path has risks and merits, but it is guided by individual priorities. And so while this group has a collective vision of where they want to go, how they get there can look different. There, does, there do need to be some stopping points along the way, a time to check in, make sure that there are enough resources to make it to the next stopping point, a chance to report back to worried parents that were left back home, an opportunity to alter the course because of maybe a road closure, a detour, or perhaps an opportunity to see something that they didn't know about when they first started out, the biggest ball of rubber bands, anything. The idea, though, is that we have these milestones or these stopping points to assess progress. And then finally, sharing is a form of reporting. With sustainability frameworks, transparency is a key aspect. There are many different types of selfies that can share a story or uh, and reflect that personal experience. They can be in, from the perspective of, look how far I've come. They can focus on the present as to here I am, this is where I am right now, today, or they can be progressive, like, look where I'm going. Any of these messages can be powerful and they all have a place. So again, these elements of a road trip align pretty nicely with the sustainability framework, which is about defining, deciding what the goal is, planning, and then implementing. And then through there, there are some smaller steps that really are a focus on some transparency. So while we have 
well, we can start to enter into some of these sustainability conversations, recognizing that we're talking about long-term plans. We're talking about some plans that have some definition to them, some roadways mapped out, but not necessarily all of them. What, what I've come to witness over this last year is that these conversations are very personal. Whenever I've been working with, uh, talking with dairy farmers in particular, we can talk about sustainability, but whenever we start to try and look at it for a given farm, the conversations, um, the confusion and some of the questions that come up in these conversations, you know, point to some very personal feelings. What I share with you here are some of the questions that, that I've heard over the last year. You know, why is dairy under the spotlight for greenhouse gas emissions? Or my farm is a century farm that seems to exemplify sustainability. You know, how do you define sustainability? So I share some of these questions, you know, to recognize that just having that road trip analogy as a starting point is just a starting point. We do need to be able to look then and discuss these, have deeper conversations. If it interests you, I did um, record some answers to these particular questions. And I share a Z link here in the slide and I'll um, put it in the chat box towards the end of the presentation as well. So as we dive deeper into sustainability conversations, recognizing that sustainability goals and actions are personal, we start to, we start to hear, we start to learn about some more terminology. Again, I'm not going to dive into all of the terminology that's associated with sustainability science, but rather what are, you know, what are from my perspective, some key aspects, some key points of this science that enables to us to have a little bit deeper conversation, um, both within the industry, but also external to the dairy industry. To have effective communication, it does require a common language. And so in the course of you know, sharing our farm stories or the farms that we work with, their stories, we also have to be able to take in some different language. There are a lot of different sustainability statements, visions out there. Most, um, most companies are looking at defining it for themselves as are most industries. In the interest of time and um, for purposes of this talk, I'm gonna, I'm gonna focus on the, what's called the net zero initiative that's been put forward by the US dairy. The net zero initiative states that by 2050, US dairy collectively commits to become carbon neutral or better, optimize water use while maximizing recycling and improve water quality by optimizing utilization of manure and nutrients. So this particular statement demonstrates priorities, it demonstrates a vision, it demonstrates a timeline that this goal is, is bracketed by. But then as we look deeper into some of these priorities, we do pull out, start to pull out some terms, carbon neutral. Carbon neutral is one of these terms that we hear more and more about, um, but what does it mean? Carbon neutral is about balancing carbon emissions with removals through sinks or offsets. A sink is somewhere that can store carbon, not necessarily forever. A sink can be drained, correct? But it is someplace to store. And an offset is, uh, is a way to compensate for emissions through, um, through sinks or some something somewhere else. So the US dairy or the net zero initiative, excuse me, uh, initially came out with this term carbon neutral or better. But again, there are some nuances to this, to this science. The US dairy industry has since altered the wording of their priority to be uh, greenhouse gas neutral. And it's again, means a fairly similar concept, but by saying greenhouse gas neutral, it is being more specific as to what it is that the industry is striving for. Greenhouse gas neutral is about balancing greenhouse gas emissions, <coughs> excuse me, at a rate equal to, um, equal to removal from the atmosphere, again, through sinks or offsets. So there are these, these terms, carbon neutral, climate neutral, net zero, greenhouse gas neutral. And I think the intention is the same behind all of them. But as we start to dig into some of the nuances, we can add some more specificity to it. Not all of our greenhouse gases are carbon based and hence that's a big, big push for this change. 
Another term that we frequently hear in these conversations uh, as it relates to sustainability is footprint. A footprint is a typical metric, especially for carbon or greenhouse gases. It can also be applied to land use or water use. But what does that mean? What is a footprint? Well, first consider you know, your own footprint. A footprint has an area, it has a depth. It's the impact on the ground beneath you, or it's your impact on the ground beneath you. It's a measure of you, but it is also a measure of what you're doing. Your footprint looks different whether you're walking or running or carrying a child in your arms, lugging something behind you. The footprint looks very different depending on what it is that you're doing. An environmental footprint is the impact of a thing or an action on natural resources. In this particular example, a greenhouse gas footprint is the amount of greenhouse gases that are produced minus those that are consumed or those that are sunk into the system during production of something, during production of a functional unit. So by using, looking at this sum of greenhouse gases produced or consumed, we start to tailor it to what that function is. So the functional unit, the denominator of this equation can, can vary and we can use multiple functional units. In the case of dairy, our functional unit is often a glass of milk or it might be um, a per mass of milk. Sometimes a footprint might be expressed per farm or per animal. There's a lot of different ways to express a footprint. To go about getting the amount of greenhouse gases produced or consumed, the, the science, the math, the modeling, and, and sometimes a bit of the art to making these calculations is called life cycle analyses. The dairy industry in the US and, and elsewhere in the world, there have been several life cycle analyses commissioned to try to make a sum of what are all of these greenhouse gases produced or consumed on average. So the, these footprints enable us to tell a story about, about a metric and they put that metric in terms of a function in the, in the dairy industry's case, usually per glass of milk. So as a number, you know, it seems pretty straightforward. But there are a lot of numbers up there. And right now I'm going to put up or ask Annie to share a poll with you. Up on the screen, you see three numbers, three numbers with fairly similar units. What is the footprint of dairy milk? Do you see it as option one, option two, or option three? If you take a minute and just tally your, tally your vote. We'll give it just a couple more seconds here. Mm -hmm. A lot of answers coming in very quickly. <laughs> Good. All righty. So it looks like we have 44% of people saying um, option one, 33% option two, and 22% at option three. Thank you. So yeah, my question, you know, which one is correct? This is where having some background literacy helps us ask meaningful questions when we are presented with these various numbers, varying data. All three of these numbers are footprints for dairy milk. So everyone is correct in this one, in this answer, in this particular poll. The reason that we do have three different numbers though, are that these footprints are a function of the scope of the underlying analysis and how where the study occurred. In this particular example, get my things to come up. This particular example, we have some different underlying scopes to these three numbers. The first one is what we call a cradle to grave number. So cradle is from is a cradle to grave number encompasses all of those resources that it takes to rate to initiate that cow that will produce that milk all the way to when that milk is consumed or disposed of. So that's called cradle to grave. <coughs> In other industries, it might be called cradle to plate. The second number is what we call cradle to farm gate or cradle to gate. In that case, it's all of the resources that are used to, to raise a cow all the way to when the milk leaves the farm gate and is going off to the processor. 
looking at these three numbers, the first one in the in the background information on the number, it specified it was a cradle to grave type number. The second one was a cradle to farm gate. The third one, as I was pulling up this number, it was really hard to find. So the, my point here is that all of these numbers, if you look at the scope behind the number, the scopes are different. If we're looking at all the way from the production of raising of that cow all the way to when the milk is consumed, there are a lot more steps, a lot more little pieces to it, rather than just getting it to when the milk leaves the farm gate. And so that does result in some different numbers. But the other aspect that's different between these numbers is <coughs> what area the number was designed for, or not designed for, but what data went into these calculations. The first one was a US-based study. The second one was an Australian-based study. And the third one, again, the, the data, the way the data was presented, the scope or the underlying region of data that was used in this number just simply wasn't clear. So I share these numbers um, because I think it opens up some of these questions that we can ask without necessarily knowing all of the science and, and how to intricately do all the different calculations. When we are presented with <coughs> different metrics, I think it behooves us, us all to ask more questions. You know, where did this number come from? What was the scope of the study? What, all, what are all the processes that went in behind this number? And where was this study done? Because if we look at the different practices for dairy production across the world, they're vastly different for a lot of different reasons. And that's not necessarily, a, um, the different practices aren't necessarily a bad thing, but it is important that we are, you know, comparing apples with apples. So before we leave this terminology topic, I just want to come back to that <clears throat> point about, or my assumptions about sustainability as a practice versus a state. If we consider sustainability a state, what something or someone is, saying I am sustainable or that farm is not sustainable. That's that's like a state of being. Whereas if we talk about practices, we're talking about what someone or something is doing. <coughs> Excuse me. Implementing sustainable practices or changing practices to reach some some particular goals. The reason I, I put this assumption and this slide in here is that I know I am guilty of, of using sustainability as a state in, in a lot of different ways. But what we're talking about generally with these sustainability goals is a path forward and towards a specific set of goals. And with all of our different definitions of what that might look like, you know, it's a more, I think it's more important to recognize the practices that we're implementing, the things we're trying to do along this journey versus focusing on that end destination. So with that, what that carbon footprint example I shared earlier taught us is that the scope to a number, the boundaries that we include in our goals and actions, they're critical to understanding each other. So when we start talking about boundaries, we can look at this from a couple different perspectives. We all have boundaries or, or our own bubbles, as I like to call them, as individuals, as companies or industries. We have different visions of that road trip, that sustainability road trip what that end destination is and how we can get there. But when we look deeper, we can usually find some overlap, whether it's in that final destination, a stopping point, you know, or a common desire to get the best gas mileage. There is usually some overlap that we can find. We can also look at the scope or the boundaries from a farm perspective. Every dairy farm has its own fence line but each dairy is also associated with feed production, manure management, energy production. <coughs> a cradle to farm gate approach to greenhouse gas footprinting and other uh, metrics considers these four key areas of focus. And this particular slide does come from the net zero initiative. And I share this because in many cases, the feed production aspect catches many people unaware. It's an important part to environmental footprints for for livestock, not just dairy. Um, and it's also where we recycle back our manure. You know, our footprints are not just simply what happens within the barn in the raising of the animals, it's also those resources that go into the production of those animals. So by looking at 
the underlying scope or asking these questions about the underlying scope, trying to understand the system boundaries. Again, we're moving conversations forward. Not everyone will know <laughs> these in, this information behind a number, but it does open up some conversation and, and more questions about what is included, what is not included. So I put up a list here on the screen. It includes a lot of different categories, all the way from machinery to herbicides, <coughs> plastic wraps, bedding materials. And you know, do you or the company uh, or your company associate with any of these categories? You know, many, many folks that I talk to in the industry, of course, aren't necessarily associated with some of these specific products, but they are support, they support farms through support farms financially or they support animal health and productivity. The reason I share this list is that in in our accounting of greenhouse gas emissions or in our accounting of resource usage, it is uh, any and all of these things can go into our into our milk production. Between 2007 and 2016, there are at least 44 different life cycle analyses done for dairy production shared in peer reviewed journals. All of these categories were considered in at least one of those analyses. So if you think back to that greenhouse gas footprint equation, changes in any of these numbers has potential to influence the greenhouse gas production, or excuse me, the the carbon footprint or the greenhouse gas footprint for dairy production, the amount of greenhouse gases produced or consumed. Do we have the right data, you know, for, for products that your company produces or products that you're recommending to producers or farmers? Do we have good numbers in terms of the greenhouse gases that are produced in the consumption, produced in the formation of lime, in the formation of plastic wraps. Can we do a better job of that accounting? Can we do a better job of being transparent and sharing that? You know, when it comes to financial health support or animal health and productivity, I share this because, well, we can use a certain amount of resources that produce or consume a certain amount of greenhouse gases. If we also change that functional unit using those same resources, if we increase our productivity, for example, we are still changing that carbon footprint. So within our own bubbles, we may set sustainability goals or have visions of what that looks like and how to get there. We hopefully have some overlap amongst the people that we work with, the clients that we advise. But I also challenge, especially those that advise dairies to ask that question, as you're making recommendations, as you're working with advisors, can you, could you answer the question, how does this recommendation affect my sustainability plan? So I'll leave that with you as a, for a, a grain of, grain of thought. The last part of this presentation is about action. You know, as I mentioned earlier, there is this difference between saying I am sustainable or I am changing practices to reach a goal. So what are some of those actions to move ourselves or those that we advise towards some uh, distant goals? Action can take a lot of different forms. I heard this perspective some, from someone in the dairy supply chain who's in charge of sustainable sourcing. And I thought it was it was specific, but it was also it provided some very nice guidance. The perspective was is that right now, a key step to a key step for action is simply having some baseline numbers to engage in conversations, having a baseline footprint for a farm to say, I know what a carbon footprint is for my farm. I know what the resource usage is. I know what my water use is. In the near future, uh, the perspective is, is that there is more to gain from showing change or showing a willingness to change versus a specific metric value. As we near the end point for goals, the Net Zero Initiative has a 2050 goal, but several companies might have 2030, 2025 goals even. As we get closer to the end point of some of these goals, that's when having specific metric values becomes more important. It becomes more important for partners looking to meet their own goals. And so I, I put this up because there is, uh, as with, uh, you know, 
human behavior. There is a huge range of um, starting points for farms at this point in time. Some are looking to become engaged and some are already well on their way to meeting their own goals. There is a step, there is a point in action for everybody. And that action might be simply looking to get a baseline number started. There are a lot of different tools in the toolbox for right now to try and help move some of these forward. Some are freely available online. Others require some more specialized training to do. I like to focus in on the calculators in the middle. For the dairy industry, the FARM environmental stewardship module is one that the US Dairy uh, Milk Producers Federation support and they um, it provides it does provide this assessment or overview. The farm environmental stewardship overview quantifies the dairy farm's greenhouse gas and energy use footprints and also asks about the use of nutrient management plans. So in doing so, these assessments provide some um, supply chain transparency and support continuous improvement. The farm receives a report back and the dairy industry is able to aggregate a, a broader set of data to reflect the U.S. dairy industry's practices. So there are a lot of, um, there are some different definite strengths to this particular program, but as I showed in the list before, there are other tools available for someone who's trying to explore this topic. So I'm going to come back to this four key areas of focus slide. It looks a little different this time, um, but Annie, if you don't mind putting up my the second poll, I wanted to query this group. What area do you focus on? Now, I recognize some of you focus on the whole farm, but is there one particular area that you tend to focus on? We'll give it just a few more seconds for sure. answers to come in. All right, it looks like we have 22% at feed production, 11% at manure handling, 33% at animal care, and 33% at energy use and production. Wow, fairly evenly split amongst all four. So the going back to this, where can we have influence within this, uh, within our, our farm scope or within this cradle to farm gate scope, there are different areas where we, we as individuals may focus a lot of our time and attention and they all, mel they all do meld together in some form or fashion. As far as action goes, as, far to the, as part of the net zero initiative, there have been some pathways laid out, some ideas for action laid out. And so I share this, this slide, this list of actions that the, the industry has put forward, you know, from a feed production and practice change arena, we know of we know there are a lot of different conservation practices that are available for feed production. Many of many have been doing these conservation practices for a long time and and others are simply starting to explore them. Enteric methane reduction, um, again, it's we have cow comfort and health maximizing, optimizing our cow comfort and health. Feed additives are perhaps a little bit more in the distant future, at least in the US, um, but they do provide a lot of hope in, in some more ways to reduce enteric methane reduction. And then on the manure handling and nutrient management, we hear, um, uh, I know in Europe, there is a lot more advanced manure treatment and handling in the US. We are hearing more and more digesters, more and more about anaerobic digesters because of some new markets. Um, but regardless, with every farm, there are some different steps that can be taken. Within every area, there are some different steps that can be taken. Some already are, and some, um, some could be, and some we do need some more research, some more technology advancements to make them feasible. So I, I put up the, the poll just to help everybody ground themselves in at least a little bit of an area of, of where some recommendations or where in that space they work, there are some actions that can be taken. Part of the challenge with, with this sustainability world, <laughs> with the sustainability space, is that we are talking about long-term strategic goals. 
how do we maintain momentum with this, what I call a slow moving train? We have very distant goals. In the case of um, US dairy industry, it's 2050. And we're only talking about doing annual assessments, right? Or looking at annual assessments to, to track baseline movement. And many of the actions that are proposed to move these are multi-year actions. So I, I share this as, I share this slide, this perspective to say that, you know, we we have this slow moving train. It feels there, there's a lot of pressure for action and stuff, but we have to recognize that, that a lot of these actions that we're talking about, a lot of these goals, we are talking about distance, uh, distance goals planning for the future. So at the end of this, I come back to those guiding assumptions. <clears throat> Again, do they still make sense? Do they still make sense to me? Do they still make sense to you? That sustainability goals and actions are personal. We all have a different road trip. We might have some very common elements to that distant goal of where we're moving, whether it's as an individual or a company or for the clients that we serve, you know, but and where is that overlap? Whenever we look at these different goals, we are prioritizing certain aspects of an operation. And I, I tended to focus on environmental in this particular presentation, but there are other sustainability related goals that <clears throat> may supersede other priorities. We know that there are gonna be benefits and consequences to every decision that's guided by priorities. And being able to phrase what those benefits, what those consequences are, just recognizing what they are, again, is part of that communication and part of that transparency behind sustainability. I do encourage everyone to look at sustainability as a practice, you know, as something about moving forward versus a state of being. When we focus solely on sustainability as a state of being, we can, it's, it's easier to judge and it may seem harder to move as well from a state versus changing an action does seem more plausible. <clears throat> and I do encourage everyone to embrace the ambigu ambiguity as an opportunity versus a risk. So this is part of a, a series of presentations that I've been giving on this topic over the past year. If you do have a minute, I would appreciate some of your feedback on, on your perspectives of both the presentations, but of both the presentation, but also your journey in the sustainability space. I provide a what I call a Z-link or a hot link to it, as well as a, a QR code. With that, I am going to ask Annie if there's any questions. Um, yes, we do have one, um, but while we wait to see if any others come in, would you mind going to the next slide, Dr. I would. Perfect. Um, again, thank you so much for your time. Um, we do also want to invite everyone to our next webinar, which will be on Friday, December 9th. Um, we will be joined by Dr. Borbala Forres of the University of British Columbia Animal Welfare Program. Um, and she's gonna be giving an intriguing presentation on monitoring behavior um, in individual and group house cattle, um, looking at smart barn technologies. So um, definitely will be a very interesting presentation. That's um, fascinating. Yes, absolutely. And that's actually our last webinar of the year. So uh, we are looking forward to that. Um, so one question that came through is um, talking a little bit more specifically um, on air quality tests. Um, do you know how air quality tests are conducted in windy areas? Air quality tests, I, I do. Um, the bulk of my research has been on, on air quality measurements, and that's somewhat what led me into this field, you know, greenhouse gas measurements. There's uh, the way that we do air quality tests does depend on what it is that you're trying to measure. And so I'll maybe start talking, but if you do want to clarify the type of measurement that you're talking about as I'm talking, that would that would be very helpful too. When we talk about air quality, we can look at concentration and we can look at emission. Concentration is you know, the measure of, or the mass or the volume of a particular pollutant or contaminant in a, in a volume or a mass of air. And concentration is what we use to assess um, the potential for, for damage to people, places, or people or things within an area. We can look at concentrations within a barn 
<clears throat> and then we can also look at concentrations downwind or within the, within an area. There is a lot of ambient air quality monitoring that goes on in the US and in other countries to assess what is the air quality and that's looking at concentrations. The emission is how much of a pollutant is moving from one area to another per unit time. And so in the air quality space, you know, emission uh, from a barn perspective, if we're looking at how much is emitted from a barn um, per unit time, that that is moving pollutants from inside the barn to outside or to downwind, and then that's dispersed um, by wind and other natural effects uh, downwind and then influences the concentration downwind. So when we're measuring air quality, um, if we're simply measuring concentration, there are a lot of different techniques that we can use to measure concentration. And depending on the gas, um, we can have monitors set in place that continuously look at those concentrations and change it. There's some evolution to use more broader monitoring via planes or vehicles to do almost surveys of air quality at different points in time. Um, there's drones that are being introduced to do some of these measurements. They all have their pluses and minuses. Are we getting a continuous measurement in one, one place over time so we can capture some of that those changes from a biological system that is a farm or because of weather, you know, or are we getting a broader spread, broader spread, uh, broader spread awareness of what air quality is using some other methods. So um, if there's some clarification, I can, I can go into a bit more detail, but there are a lot of different techniques and then emission is a bit of another beast to measure as well. I, th I think that answer that, I guess we'll see if anything uh, else comes in. Sure. Um, is there some kind of a list of CO2 emission levels for different farming practices that could help to evaluate the level of a dairy, or that could help to evaluate the level of a specific dairy's level of sustainability? Yeah, so there is, you know, carbon dioxide is one of the greenhouse gases, and then there are some others, <laughs> methane and nitrous oxide in particular. And each gas has their own sources in a barn. Carbon dioxide is produced by the manure, but it's also produced by respiration. Methane is produced by the enteric methane as well as the manure. Nitrous oxide can be produced by manure, but it's um, more likely, you know, the feed production is going to be a bigger source of the nitrous oxide. And so are there, are there some I guess what I'm what I'm hearing in that question is, are there some baseline emission estimates for these different sources? And there are, there are models, there are calculations to try and make these estimates. For carbon dioxide, what is typically used is uh, a relationship to heat production. And then that's equated, or a carbon dioxide um, amount per unit of heat production is often a good starting point for CO2 production, at least through respiration. But it doesn't do a good, as good a job of accounting for what comes from the manure. There, there's been different literature estimates that it could be 5%, it could be 100% you know, of what is respired uh, from, from an animal. So that's, that's one starting point for CO2 specifically. Or if we are talking about any of the carbon gases like methane, uh, for methane, there, you know, the a large focus is on the, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, there is a large focus on the manure storage. In that case, um, the International Panel on Climate Change, IPCC, has, has some models that, um, that estimate those methane emissions from different types of manure storages in different parts of the country based on the storage type and based on temperature. Um, Excuse me. We have a, a comment and then another question. Um, sure. The comment is, thank you so much for the webinar. It is hot everywhere, but the US approach is very different than ours in Europe. So I found this presentation very interesting. Um, it is, the is. There are some very different perspectives. I think I did try to take it more from a higher level approach. Uh, you know, recognizing there are some different approaches and, and people are at different stages in this journey, particularly between countries. Um, but I, I do like to focus more on the communication aspect of it. Absolutely. 
Um, so when a farmer is looking to set some sustainability goals, what do you recommend that they evaluate first to really know where to even begin? Right. <clears throat> So with sustainability goals, I do like to emphasize that we are talking about long-term plans. We can't ignore that, you know, a farm has to be in business the next day <laughs> in order for it to be, to start to be in business for 25 years down the road, you know. So I, I look at resiliency as, as managing day-to-day -day unexpected events, being, being resilient to those changes, and then sustainability as, as those longer-term goals, almost like succession planning in a way. So as a starting point, I do think it's important to, <clears throat> to have some baseline calculations done, whether it's a carbon footprint or looking at um, just simply some, you know, compilation of records as far as what resources are being used and how having some of that type of data to, to start to base some decisions on. And I, I emphasize the carbon footprint because I think it just exposes exposes us to uh, to recognize that oftentimes these footprints you know <clears throat> include things that are outside of our own control some farms have the ability to control where all their feed comes from and others don't you know but recognizing that a footprint is going to encompass all of those aspects i think first of all gives us a vision for what it is that that we're focusing on or that where we can focus so that we can start to pinpoint where we have decision making power or where we have some partnership or cooperation or where some partnerships or cooperations are needed. So as that first step, I do think having a baseline is an important step of action. Then, then it is about what are the priorities for this farm from in the environmental space um, or climate change, greenhouse gas emissions are important. In some regions, you know, water quality is, water quality concerns or nutrient management <clears throat> can be just as critical and just as vital um, for, for a longevity standpoint. And so it is about looking at a particular farm's um, impact. I'm using environment as an example, but where those, where those impacts, where those impacts are, you know, and, and what's, what is most important for the farm and then by having the baseline and just that recognition of that of what those priorities are then you can start to look at well what are some actions to move in that direction thank you so much i am not seeing any more questions um so we'll see if any come in in the last minute um but thank you again so much dr cordis for sharing all of your insights with us we really appreciate this was an excellent presentation i do appreciate the opportunity to be here with you you know please feel free to reach out continue the conversation um, if you are looking for some resources i'm happy to share what i can perfect well, thank you again, everyone, for joining us this Friday, um, and we hope we see you in our next webinar. Thank you. Thank you.